I'm at a point now where I just got out of a pretty tough relationship with WWE. I love my time there, but apparently they didn't love my time there. How did it come together with TNA? When I knew I was leaving WWE, I wanted to go to Impact, but then when I found out it was gonna be TNA, I was like, I gotta go to TNA. Was your goal as a kid to be in the WWE or to play in the NFL? I really wanted to play in the NBA. Football became my sport just because I stopped growing. You got heat in pro wrestling, you got heat in football. Both of them for standing up for what's right. Ain't that crazy? How did you know your NFL career was done? It was. I just started wrestling and I love wrestling. We're doing this in person. Thank you so much for coming by. Yeah, no, it's awesome to actually finally be able to do this for sure. You're drinking that F3 energy? I'll, I'll have oh. one too. If you got them in your hands. You know what I'm saying? As well. F3 energy. Yeah. Focus, energy, <laughs> mood. <laughs> you are deceivingly large in person. Yeah. Like, I, I think people know you're big. Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Salute. There it is. You know? Oh, we got a tropical theory, right? Hold That's on. my favorite flavor, but I'm figure I'll drink some original here right now. You know, us, uh, us diabetics, we need zero sugar. <laughs> so this uh, is sugar free, sugar free, no calories, zero carbs. Yeah, that's actually really good. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. That is not a cheap plug. <laughs> that is really good. It's turning into one now. <laughs> I would tell you this was shit if it was shit. <laughs> yeah, you're deceivingly large. I, I, people know you're big. People mm -hmm. know you played in the NFL. Yeah. But then you see you in person, and you must always get the like, did you, did you play in, did you play football? Yeah. Or? So it's funny because I get two different things. Okay. Or three different things. One thing I always get is, what do you do? <laughs> Which is incredibly rude. But uh, <laughs> it happens or, all the time. It's or like, like a wonderful compliment. <laughs> like. it, no, but it loosely translates to, why do you exist this large? <laughs> right? So that's what I get. <laughs> Obviously, I get, do you, do you play football? Like on the flight here... Um, from, I was in Sacramento. I had a signing in Sacramento. I came to LA for another signing. And um, on the flight, get boarding the flight here, a guy was like, you, play, you playing in the game for the Niners tomorrow? <laughs> and it's like funny, because I actually did play in the NFL. He doesn't know that, obviously. Sure. But like, I'm like, nah, I'm not. But like, I get that. Do you play football all the time? But the one that's always hilarious, it's people always ask, you got to play basketball, which proves to me they don't know what basketball players look like. Because yes, I am 6'5", and there are basketball players that are 6'5", but I'm 330 pounds. The basketball players that are 6'5 are like 165 pounds. And the basketball players that are 330 pounds are like Shaq. Yeah, are like eight feet tall, <laughs> yeah. right? You know like, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's funny the, the juxtaposition of how people think big people are in sports as well, but like, it happens a lot where people meet me and they say, you're a lot bigger than I thought. Because in WWE or just entertainment in general, like people are shot in a way so that everyone looks larger than life, everyone looks big. So like, yeah, if they go out of their way to let everyone know you are super big like they do with Braun Strowman and those guys, sure. or if you just actually are the largest human walking earth like Omas, <laughs> like then obviously, but like I'm 6'5", real life 6'5", yeah. uh, measured at Pro Day 6'5". Um, and B-Fab is like 5'9", five 5'10", five but she also wears heels. So like on any given day, she's six foot, six one. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. She's taller than Ashante the Adonis when she has her heels on. Um, so like standing next to her, you can't really see that I'm 6'5", you know what I'm saying? But I, I get that all the time. So what a weekend then. You were in Tampa mm -hmm. to Sacramento yep. to LA to Orlando. Yeah. All in the course of three days. So I live in Orlando. Um, Saturday, I drove from Orlando to Tampa, uh, stole the show with Joey Janela at GCW, look at me. People have been talking about it all weekend. Uh, great match. Shout out Joey. Great match. Great opponent. Um, that night, went to Battle Rumble with Mega Ran, DNA, Max Caster was there, Leo Rush was there. It's this really cool hip-hop wrestling show where like we all perform songs, and then we did a cypher at the end. It's been getting a lot of traction. Mega Ran's going to take it on the road. I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff with him with that. Um, that was also in Tampa, same night, double booked, same night. Um, then didn't even have time to sleep because that same night, 5 a.m., I fly out of Tampa to Sacramento. I land in Sacramento, go straight to a signing. I do a signing in Sacramento, watch the Rumble. People pay these like VIP things to not just see me, but we all watch the Rumble together. It was a great time. People at Barrios Toys, great people. I can't wait to go back, love yeah. my time there. Um, and then went to my hotel, played FIFA, I know, EA Sports FC, <laughs> um, played the video game till about three in the morning when I had to leave for my next flight, which was 6 a.m. in uh, to LA. 6 a.m. flight to L.A., landed in L.A., 7.30, took a nap, 
after I after my nap, got picked up, went and kicked it with the great people at Jimmy's World Order. Love Jimmy. Love Jimmy. They're great so people. Great. They yep. told me to bring that you work with them to bring yeah. it up. They, they know you like uh, you guys work together. Um, did the show with them, a signing with them. Um, then after that, went back to the hotel, played EA Sports FC again. <laughs> you know, I'm seeing a trend here. Before I passed out and finally got. 10 hours of sleep, which is more than I got in the previous four days combined. And then here we are. And now, and then I woke up to a text from you saying I'm 15 minutes away. Oh, so, that was a, that was a wake up that text? That was a wake up text. Uh, and for the record, I picked him up at 1 p.m. Oh, yeah. PM. I needed every ounce of that sleep for sure. So you're traveling more than you ever did with WWE. Yeah, and I'm making more money too. It's crazy because like, I made more money this weekend than I made at any time, any weekend I was ever in WWE. I think that will surprise a lot of people. Yeah, it will surprise a lot of people. It actually surprises me. Uh, I, it's at the point where, like, you know, I loved my time in WWE, but they decided to do something else and go another direction. But there's not just one place in this world you can make money. And so now I'm using the fact that I have these connections already in the wrestling industry. I have a fan base of people that want to see me People flew me from flew me from Royal Rumble weekend to Sacramento and LA just to have sign pictures and I mean sign autographs, take pictures. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a great time and I'm enjoying my time being able to do the things that I love, like going to GCW, like going to TNA, like being able to do all the other things that I'm going to be doing this year that people don't even know is coming yet. We haven't even touched on music yet either. Yeah, talk so, about it. Yeah. Huada. <laughs> Come on, man. So, I mean, it's all of this and then also music on top where yeah. it seems like you're really grinding there yeah, too. Yeah, so I just released my new single, We Outside, um, with DJ Who Kid with 3O Black, produced by Slushy. Um, great song. It's my entrance music. Um, you know, we're working on the music video now. Um, you know, we did the music video for the TNA show, but it really, that was all a setup just to get the Joe Hendry thing. It was so funny to see people's reaction online, like, ah, oh, TNA's back to trash because they're doing music videos. Why are they signing AJ Francis? In the meantime, it's all a work. It was, the video was never going to play longer than 25 seconds, right? So when you see, but, but because it works so well, because you can play wrestling fans like fiddles, like you know how they're going to react to these things. If you go back and watch the clip, TNA did it on purpose. They didn't, a lot of times when you like play a music video, you like overlay the audio so that you don't hear the audience, yep. right? Yep. So you can hear the video. But the video plays for like 25 seconds and you hear the audience booing the entire time <laughs> because you, that's what you want. You want them so that when Joe Hendry's face appears on the screen, they're like, yeah, <laughs> because that's wrestling. How did it come together with TNA? Um, you know, um, I, have, I uh, trained at the Team 3D Academy when I first started um, wrestling. So I had a relationship with, with Bully Ray already. Um, and I, one of the very best friends that I've made in this industry, he's like my second dad really, is Mark Henry. He looks like my dad too. Please, when you edit this, put a picture of him and my dad. I'll send you the picture of them together. Okay. Uh, he looks like my dad. He looks like my dad's like next level evolved a, po a Pokemon, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, uh, you know, he has, I have a very good relationship with him and they both also, um, uh, do Busted Open Radio with Tommy Dreamer. And because of that, I also have a relationship with Tommy. And I've talked to Tommy and Bully and about going to TNA. I really, when I l knew I was leaving WWE, like, I wanted to go to TNA. Like, it wasn't like, um, and honestly, I wanted to go to Impact. But then when I found out it was going to be TNA, I was like, oh, I got to go to TNA. Yeah. Like, I was knocking down Tommy's door. It's like, so... Uh, my 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 agent A B Albert um, he does a lot of work with like Swerve and and other people too. Uh, he you know talked to Tommy a lot and talked to Scott for me and and we set it up so you know we have a very good relationship now and um, you know it was funny because like you know people there's there's thanks to guys like Dave Meltzer who just say things without facts or any actual backup or just innuendos and just lie on my name and perpetuate these myths that I'm a terrible person when not a single person's ever come on record to say, hey, this is the thing that he did. What, what is the thing that I've ever done? You tell me. I don't know. What are you accused of? Uh, exactly. I'm accused of being a bad person. And when people ask why or how, it's, oh, he's hard to work with. Oh, he's hard to work with. Well, nobody who's ever actually worked with me thinks I'm hard to work with. AJ Styles doesn't think I'm hard to work with. Rey Mysterio doesn't think I'm hard to work with. 
Legato doesn't think I'm hard to work with. Pete Dunn doesn't think I'm hard to work with. The Usos don't think I'm hard to work with. Rhea Ripley doesn't think I'm hard to work with. Naomi doesn't think I'm hard to work with. Paul Heyman doesn't think I'm hard to work with. Michael, Michael Hayes doesn't okay, think Okay, we're not going to go down the whole list here. Yeah. I get it. I so understand like, so, the point so you're who, making. So who are, the, who, are these, who are these people? You know what I'm saying? But because of that, you know, um, like you have these guys who like Tommy's like, you know, telling people at TNA, like, bring him in. We'll see how it works. If, he's, if he is hard to work with like they say he is, then we just won't bring him back. You know what I'm saying? Scott's like, okay, cool. I meet everybody at TNA. I do the show in Vegas. And they're like, wow, you're great to work with. Brian Myers goes on his show with uh, Matt Cardona, who I hate. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, goes, uh, he goes, man, AJ was great to work with. He's hardworking. And, you know, Scott, I have a conversation with him at TNA. He's like, man, you know, you're, you're good to be around. The boys like you. The girls like you. Like, you're not causing any problems. You're hardworking. You're on time. He's like, I, I love what the energy you bring. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it went from we'll see how it works with TNA, maybe we'll do one day in Vegas, to now like I'm at TNA for the foreseeable future. Are you signed with TNA? I'm not signed anywhere. Now Free that's agent. not saying that I wouldn't sign with TNA. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm not saying that at all. It's just like I'm at a point now where I just got out of a pretty tough relationship. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And, with uh, WWE. With WWE. Yeah. Uh, I love my time there, but apparently they didn't love my time there. So, uh, like, I'm at the point now where, like, do I want to be locked in anywhere? I don't know. That was my think thought process for the entire time. Yeah. But now that I've been at TNA and I've had such a great time at TNA and I love the people at TNA and I love what we're doing at TNA, I would not be opposed to it at all. But that's a, another conversation down the road, long-term thing. Like, that's not a conversation – that we're having right now, like, could potentially down the road, TNA be my permanent home? That would be great. I'd love that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I love working there. I go there and I have fun. I love being around that environment. So I got a lot of messages from people asking, how is it possible that you can bet on WWE PLEs at my bookie? I mean, it's scripted. How can you bet on something that's scripted? So look, I don't know the logistics behind it, but I do know that when you go to mybookie.ag, not only can you bet on WWE, you can bet on the UFC, boxing, you can bet on Jake Paul's next fight, you can bet on the NBA, you can bet on everything there. And I do know that when you sign up using the promo code CVV, you'll get a 50% bonus on your first deposit. So put in $100, now you've got $150. Put in $200, now you've got $300. You get the point. So if you're already picking the winners of these WWE events, why not make a little bit of money while you're at it? Use that promo code CVV and my bookie. I saw this like a lot of comments after your match with Joey Janela mm -hmm. about the knee that you did. Mm -hmm. and people like really, really hating on that knee and the yeah. way you flip over the top rope. Yeah, after. people think that was the first time I ever did it. They thought, so much so they thought it was an accident. They thought it was an accident. You fell over the top rope. <laughs> yes, because the gimmick, right? But the fact of the matter is, I did that move on SmackDown. I've done that move on the Indies since 2019 at SCW when I first got my first break. Shout out Mike Busey in the Sausage Castle. I. Uh, I did my, I've done that uh, at CCW a couple weeks ago. That move. They even put it in the video game. Yeah, that's in your move set in the video it's game. It's in the video game. It is called Tennessee Whiskey because it's so smooth. Oh, so smooth. So smooth, <laughs> right? So shout out Chris Stapleton. So like, uh, it's, it's really good, just like F3. <laughs> <laughs> right? Bringing it right back there around. You go. But no, like, so it's funny because like, I've been doing that move for a while. So the thing is, is like, like even with my choke slam, I gave Joe Hendry at Hard to Kill. People are like, wow, that chokeslam was incredible. Why did we never see that on WWE? I'm like, because I didn't get a chance to. Did they tell you you couldn't do a chokeslam because other people had a chokeslam? No, there's just no point in doing a chokeslam when you're losing the match in three minutes. Mm. Like, why would I give – my last match with, was with LA Knight. Go watch it. Great match. It's three minutes long. It's incredible. The crowd's going crazy the whole time. It's, it's a great time. Yeah, and it's two big personalities, two, too. And if I give – LA Knight, a choke slam in this match, in yeah. a three minute match, and he kicks out. Yeah. My choke slam is terrible. Yeah. So, why would I even think about trying to give him a choke slam? And why would he want to take that bump? Like, this match is three minutes long. My longest singles match in WWE is literally that match with LA Knight. Like, I don't, I never had time to do anything like that. And then my other long matches were tag team matches. So there's at least three. Sometimes it was a fatal four-way tag team match. Sometimes seven other people in the match that all have to be able to do things. 
what I'm saying? So it's like you can't always get your stuff in. People see me do the two-man move, the three-man move, where I carry three people around the ring. Nobody else has ever been able to do that successfully in WWE or any other high promotion I've ever seen. It's um, a lot of weight. Yeah. Three people Three, once, three people, yeah. two on my shoulders, one in my arms. Like, yeah, it's the – no one gives me my credit. It's the greatest feat of strength in the history of wrestling. Let's talk about it. Wow, that is a bold move. Let's talk about it. The only other one you can count, you can say Cena with, with, with uh, Big Show and Edge. That's, That's cool. cool, too. But he also, he didn't carry him around the ring. Yeah. What he about any time they pick up Mark Henry? Yeah, Mark Henry is a legit, well, at the time, like 400 pounds. That's less than three people. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just calling it like it is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Love Mark. You know what I'm saying? Now, I mean, he also, is your second dad. He's my second dad. He's also the strongest man ever. I'm not saying I'm stronger than Mark Henry. Yes. Mark Henry could have done that Thank move. Thank you for clarifying this. Okay. <laughs> Mark Henry could have done that Big move. Big Show probably could Big have done Show that Big Show also move. could have done that move. There's a lot of people yeah. that could have done that move. Yes. I'm just saying I'm the only one that has. I appreciate that you clarified <laughs> that before getting just destroyed in the comments here. Although, you're no stranger. They're still going to destroy me in the comments. <laughs> You're no stranger to that. Yeah. Why, what, what is the, like, why is there so much negativity thrown your way? I don't know. I mean, I think it started because I made a joke about tennis shoes. By the way, shout out the Gucci. Those are some great shoes. What, also, what size is that? Uh, 16. <laughs> uh, my, my agent, Albert, he got me those. Shout out him. I would never spend this much money on a pair of sneakers. Um, <laughs> but uh, he got them for me. Uh, what was the joke about tennis shoes? The, so I made a joke about tennis shoes, about no one in particular. And I said, these guys wear Jordans on, I believe the joke is a tweet. I said, these guys wear Jordans on uh, screen, but in real life, they wear Asics and Vans. But y'all not ready for that conversation. It's a joke, right? MVP as hot sauce, like he always does. I love MVP. He adds hot sauce to it. Gets the Twitter people talking, right? So then the Twitter people start talking, and all of a sudden, the Young Bucks decide, you know how they do their thing with the, with the change in the bio. Yeah. You know? They change the bio, and they're like, we spent more money on sneakers last year than anybody in NXT has made this year, in September, or whatever he said, whatever the joke was, right? And I didn't give a damn, personally, because I wasn't on NXT anymore. Like, I was on SmackDown. Shit on NXT all you want. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I was on SmackDown. I didn't care. But he's clearly talking about you. Yeah, they're, they're clearly, they're, they're they're clearly, clearly talking about me, but I don't care. Okay. Like, at that time, I don't care. Yeah. I'm like, all right, whatever. I don't even mention it. Like, I don't bring anything up. I don't say anything. Like, but because of the whole situation, I trended on Twitter all day. Top dollar trended all day. Right? So this is 2021. So then the next day, they put in their bio uh, – all we have to do is mention you in our bio and, and to make you relevant or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it said. Some, yeah. some along those lines. And now they're talking about me specifically. <laughs> and that's where I drew the line, right? So then I dropped the Notorious Sneaker Diss where I dissed the Young Bucks on the Young Buck beat, right? Um, that went viral. Had every wrestling blog talking about it. It went crazy. And like, bro, I don't got no real problems with the Young Bucks. Never have. I used to watch the Young Bucks at Ring of Honor in Duke Burns Arena in Baltimore, Maryland, when I was in college as a fan, I used to love the work that they did with them boys and all, all the other people they would work with in yeah. Ring of Honor and Kevin Steen. And you know what I'm saying? Like, this is where I discovered independent wrestling. Like, they were part of me discovering independent wrestling. Matt Taven was there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And Nana was there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, this is yeah. Ring of Honor. So, like, I, I had no beef with them at all. But, like, you also, I'm from Pioneer City. You're not going to play on my name. Like, that's just not going to happen. So I dropped a diss song on some respectfully watch you talking about. It went viral. And after that, you know, they got a big fan base. From that day forward, internet people hated my guts. Mm. And every opportunity they get to, to hate on me, they would. And, like, some of it is, like, lighthearted hating, and that's cool. And some of it is... I'm glad your mother's dead. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Who so says it, that? You'd be surprised how many times I get comments like that. Or, like, I notoriously went famous, uh, went viral one time because um, TSA went through my bag uh, after my mom's funeral, and I had uh, her ashes put together, and they, like, made sure it was ashes, but when they put it back together, they didn't put it back right, so it spilled in my bag. Oh. Yeah, it was trash. 
And uh, it was awful. And um, like people would be like, talk about, like make jokes about that in my mentions and stuff. Like I'm used to things like that. So yeah. that's why people were like, how do you deal with haters? I don't care about them people. Them people's lives are miserable. Like anyone who is satisfied financially, mentally, sexually, <laughs> doesn't spend their time on the internet talking trash about people. That's just, a, that's just not what you spend your time doing. If you're wanting to burn some extra calories to help with weight, or if you're looking to detoxify after a night of perhaps overindulging, check out the infrared sauna blanket from Bond Charge. I've been using this for months and I love how the sauna blanket raises your heart rate while you're just kind of sitting there relaxing. You can burn up to 600 calories in one session. I was saying to my wife, Rachel, like how badly I wanted a sauna because I knew of all the health benefits. Then we looked at the price and then we went, oh wow, that infrared sauna blanket from Bond Charge is so much better because you get all the same benefits for a fraction of the price. It actually might be better than a real sauna because it heats up way faster in less than a minute. And then you can just sit there while you're reading or watching TV or doing whatever you want. And the infrared sauna blanket does its thing. Best of all, Bond Charge has lightning fast worldwide shipping for free and a 12 month warranty. You can save 25% this holiday season when you go right there to bondcharge.com slash CVV. This deal is hot. See what I did there? It's a sauna blanket and that's a savings of over $170. And when you go to bondcharge.com slash CVV, the code is automatically applied. So take advantage of this deal while it's still going on for the holiday season. You were in such a unique situation in WWE where you were there, you got mm -hmm. let go. They brought you back, so obviously mm -hmm. they, they had something for you. Then you got let go again. What do you think led to you getting released the first time and then being brought back? Uh, the first time I got released, I personally, I don't know. Once again, this is all here, like everything. Nobody's ever told me. Like no one's ever been like, this is what happened. They always make it seem like, oh, this is just business. And budget right? cuts, right? And that's budget, what they say. They, that's what yeah. they always try to make it seem like. But it never feels like that. It never feels like that. Like the first time I got released, it felt like I got released because I stood up for BFAB. Like that's what it felt like. It felt like because BFAB got released. Because what happened was when they were doing a bunch of call-ups, they were getting ready for the draft in 2021. John Laurinaitis came to the PC and they would have shows and they would just have him sit and watch acts because John Laurinaitis and Vince, they, they wasn't watching NXT. Like, I, I'm sorry if this is a newsflash, but they, don't watch, they didn't watch NXT. So they didn't know anybody on NXT. So they would literally come to the PC and like see the talent in the PC and like, oh, okay, that's cool. Whoa, I wonder what I can do with him. Da -da -da. So B-Fab had already planned a vacation um, that she was going on, right? So she wasn't, they, they sprung a show up on us on like, it was like a Wednesday. They were like, oh, we got a PC show Saturday for John Laurinaitis. And we're like, oh, but B-Fab was already out of town. Hmm. So she wasn't going to change her stuff to get back. And she wasn't wrestling anyway. It was a singles match, me versus Mace, which is funny, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Swerve and Tahuti were there. So the first time that John Laurinaitis ever lays eyes on Hit Row, it's just me, Tahuti, and Swerve. He doesn't even know B-Fab is there, right, mm. with the crew, which, in my opinion, she was the most integral part of the crew because if you take, if let's say you want to take the four original members of Hit Row and you want to get rid of one of them, well, if you get rid of me, you still have a beautiful woman, Valet, who can also wrestle, and you got a good tag team. Sure. With, if you get rid of Swerve, it's a beautiful woman, Valet, that can wrestle, and you have a tag team. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of uh, Ashante the Adonis, Tahuti, it's still a beautiful woman, Valet, and you got a cool tag team. But if you get rid of B-Fab, we're just hip-hop New Day. You <laughs> know what I'm saying? Like, we, we're not yeah. different than any, like, we're just a three-man group. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so she was the special element. Plus, she raps. She's sexy. She, I go places where people see me because they see how big I am, but they stare at her. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Like, so she got released for not being there? She, no, she got released because for whatever reason they released her for, I feel like John Laurinaitis didn't think she was a necessary part of Hit Row because when he mm. saw Hit Row, she wasn't with us. 
Gotcha. So when she got released, I went to Laurenitis and Vince and was like, yo, I feel like you shouldn't have did that. I feel like she added a lot to the group. I feel like, yes, we can still do this and it'll still work, but I feel like we shouldn't have did that. And that conversation is somehow how I'm an asshole three years later. Mm. Mind you, she's still in WWE right now, right? So clearly I was right. <laughs> clearly I was correct. But then you get, br you get brought back. And then yeah. I get brought back because Hunter gets the power, right? Um, and Hunter recognized the wrong of the situation as well. Uh, so Hunter calls me and says, when can I have you? Uh, and I was like, uh, tomorrow, if you book the flight, like I'm ready right now. I was like, but I don't want to come back if I'm not coming back with the rest of Hit Row. Like I told him that. Now, I don't know if me saying that is the reason he decided to bring them back too, or if he was already going to bring us all back. Yeah. But I said that to him. So then two days later, we set up a, a call with all of us and Hunter, laid out the plan, and then we re-debuted a week after that. And that's when we came out in North Carolina, and it was a great time, and the crowd reacted crazy. But then, like, after that, like, there was never really a plan for him. Like, we would pitch ideas, and 90% of the times they wouldn't use them. And a lot of times when they did use them, like, it was cool and it worked, you know? But like, sorry, but like there was never really Is a that Triple H reaching out to you right there. No, nah, that's my uh, Xbox app. I've really been on this <laughs> Xbox, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Xbox, yeah, Xbox. Jeez. So, uh, so I wish it was Triple H. I love that guy, but uh, uh, no, but uh, so it was like uh, uh, she, when we came back, like, like a perfect example. I wanted to do the diss songs. Obviously, like, the diss song went viral with the Young Bucks. Yeah. Like, the diss songs went viral a lot of times I did them. Yeah. But they never put them on TV, right? So we did one. Finally, they reach out to us, and they're like, we want you to diss the OC. And I'm like, finally. Yeah. Like, finally. So I literally, mind you, they tell me this on Wednesday at, like, 10 p.m., and my flight is Thursday at noon. <laughs> Okay. So you don't have a lot of time. So though. in about three hours, I write, record, shoot the video, edit the video, add all the caption on it, all my stuff. Oh. oh, my goodness. Now he's really calling you. Man, trap phone booming. <laughs> it is money calling, but I'm going to just let it go to voicemail. <laughs> when money calls, you're supposed to answer the phone, but for you, I'm going to let it go to voicemail. Appreciate it. So, uh, but, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I edit all this video. Whatever. Yeah. And I get it all done, and I'm like, I'm going to post it on Friday. So I posted Friday morning at, like, noon. Mm -hmm. It gets almost, across all platforms, it gets almost 2 million views by 8 p.m. So in eight hours, by the start of SmackDown, it has almost 2 million views. Yeah. Okay? So clearly it worked. Like, the plan worked. So much so that we had the match with the O.C., the, the crowd's red hot behind it. The match is great. AJ Styles at the end gives me a phenomenal forearm. Everything goes great. Couldn't ask better. That's, that night is why me and AJ Styles are so much cooler now because he had never actually worked with me. And, you know, he heard all the same rumblings about everybody else talks about me. And then that night he was like, man, you're great. I'm so happy we got to work with you. So I can't wait to work with you again, blah, blah, blah. And we became good friends after that. I call him Big AJ. He calls me Lil AJ. It's hilarious. I know. <laughs> right? So... Uh, so we do that, it goes great, and then nothing. Like, nothing ever came from that storyline. We never brought it back up. We could have did, like, a match between B-Fab and Meechin. We could have did singles matches with AJ. We could have ran back tag team matches. We never did anything, because there was never a plan for Hit Row. Did they not want you to do these diss tracks because that was Cena's gimmick, and also the acclaim no, they're doing that on AEW? No, no. The one good thing is that Paul Heyman used to stand up for me a lot, and... Paul Heyman would say, they can't see the difference between what, like, John Cena and Max Castor and what you're doing. He said, theirs is like, uh, not comedy, but like, kayfabe rap. Like, it's rap within the wrestling realm. Yeah. Yours is like, actual, livable, breathable hip hop. Mm. And, you know, he said, because of that, it makes it more real. So, like, if you're not into that, you can't understand it. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, like, 
Did they want me to not do them? No, they had no problem with me doing them. They just wasn't going to put them on TV. There's so many times Paul Heyman would text me, man, this should be how we start the show tonight. I would send him my video I'm doing. I sent him one I did for the Christmas show. He was like, this should start the show tonight. I did it, sent him so many different ones that we did. And uh, mind you, I never get my flowers. We, Hit Row never gets our flowers. Um, when LA Knight had that $2 million, uh, $2 million, $2 million view video on YouTube in 24 hours uh, from the Madison Square Garden dark show, we were in the segment with him. No one ever gave us our flowers for that. I don't know how many times that happened on WWE, not just with LA Knight, but just on WWE YouTube since. But we never got our flowers for that. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, never got our flowers. That The only match that, that was uh, promoted for the Christmas show that's one of the most, what is one of the highest watched shows in SmackDown history, and I think the highest watched pre tape show in WWE history, uh, the only promoted match for that was Usos versus Hit Row, okay, that, for the tag team titles. We never got our flowers for that. But Paul Heyman would always show me love. And, um, like, I would send him my videos, and he would love them. You know what I'm saying? And I would send other people my videos, and they would love them. But they just would never put them on TV. And then sometimes they, I would send, I would make videos, we would make videos, hit row, and we would send it to the creative team. And they'd be like, this is great. We're going to try to put this on the show. And then something would happen. Mm. Don't know who. Don't know why, yeah. but it just wouldn't be a part of the show. And, like, it happened with, like, L.A. Knight. Like, we did a whole segment. We were the – people don't remember this, but L.A. Knight was a heel, even though he was getting babyface reactions everywhere he went. Right. He was a heel until he crossed paths with Hit Row. That's what made him officially a babyface. Go check the timeline. And it started with that night in – uh, Madison Square Garden, yep. and then he ended up having a match with Tahuti two weeks later, and then yeah. uh, Ashante, and then he had a match with me two weeks after that, which is my last match in WWE, mm -hmm. right? Go look at all of that. During that whole time, like, we, I had the idea to set up our match. I made a diss song. I made, I'll, yeah, I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. I, you, can, you can put it on your show for all I care. It don't matter no more. Whatever you want. Yeah, but uh, I made a diss song <clears throat> that was dope to try to set up a match with L.A. Knight. Because we were already going to have a match, but, like, add a little juice to it so that when he eventually beats my ass, which is what happened, there's, like, oh, yeah, L.A. Knight, yeah, right? So they loved it. But then they were, like, oh, well, we don't know if we can use the things you – some of the things you said. Like, one of the things mm. I said was – my line was, they say you biting off Stone Cold and The Rock, but you did it wrong. You're clearly biting off Little John. Yeah, like that was the line, right? And they were like, oh, we don't know if we can say he's trying to be like Stone Cold in The Rock. And then two weeks later, The Miz said all that. <laughs> so it's like, do you not know or do you not want me to say it? You see what I'm saying? Like, it's cool. I, you ain't got the, you can literally come out and be like, we don't want you to be the person to say this. And I'll be like, respect, I know my role. My role in WWE was to be the cla class clown punching bag. Like, do I think that anyone who actually was saying these things to me uh, in character would ever say that to my face in real life? No. These fans, no. They never would. Because I'm playing a role. I'm playing a character. I'm cool with that. But don't pull, like, try to pull the wool over my eyes and make it seem like, oh, well, we don't know if we could say that and then let somebody else do it like two weeks yeah. later. I think people also forget that Bray Wyatt's last segment mm -hmm. was with Hit Row. It was. Bray Wyatt's last segment was Hit Row. Bray Wyatt loved working with Hit Row. We actually had this idea. Have you ever seen the movie Leprechaun in the Hood? <laughs> Can't say I have. Great movie, right? Well, maybe I'll watch it tonight with the wife. Um, you'll enjoy it. It's one of those movies that's so bad that it's good. I love movies like that. It's so bad that it's good. It's called Leprechaun in the Hood. Have you ever heard of the Leprechaun franchise? Of course, yeah. So... The whole theory of this, this thing is the leprechaun has this magic flute, and if you get it, you get good luck. And I've good seen th the news story about yes, this. Yes, the leprechaun yeah. in Alabama? Yeah, well, it's all over. It's, okay. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a TV. It's there's a, a viral YouTube news clip about this. Yeah, like, so, but the, the movie series is like, there's like nine sequels or something. Like, it's like a cult classic. Okay. It's ridiculous. So, Leprechaun in the Hood, it stars Ice T, okay? Oh, wow. Uh, and Ice T finds this flute. 
which brings the leprechaun to life, right? But it brings you luck. But when you have the flute, the leprechaun wants his flute back, back, and if you don't give it to him, he'll just he's just trying to kill you and everybody that you're with, right? It's a comedy horror movie, right? <laughs> and it's gruesome, but it's funny, right? So, um, you know, the idea was, you know, Bray hadn't done the uh, Firefly Funhouse yet. And Bray loved this idea. Bo loved this idea. Because it was funny to me, because when I pitched the idea to him, I was like, yo, have you guys ever seen Leprechaun in the Hood? And they're like, we love that movie. Like, if you ever get a chance to interview Bo, please ask him about this. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Please ask him about this, because it was so funny. They were so into this idea. The, the idea was... We go into, we stumble across uh, stumble across the Firefly Funhouse. Abandon all hope, ye who enter, right? And B Fab's like, let's go in there. <clears throat> and I'm like, ain't you ever seen a scary movie? Like <laughs> the brothers that we need to stay away from there. All the brothers, we always die in this scary movies. I'm not finna go in there. She's like, well, would you scared? <laughs> Me being the top dollar character, I ain't scared of nothing, right? So now we go into Firefly Funhouse. We go in and there's cobwebs everywhere. All the puppets are like laying down. It's clear that nobody's been there, right? And we're looking around and we see all the things. And then eventually I see Rambling Rabbit, you know, Lucky Rabbit's foot, yeah. right? And I see Rambling Rabbit and I'm like, oh man, I pick him up. And when I pick him up, everything starts going haywire. And it's, oh, oh my God. We're like, we gotta get out of here. So we run away. It's like a Scooby Doo movie. So uh, we run away. And as we're running away, it's just like Sister Abigail doll, just like red eyes glowing, standing up like, it's, you know, giving you spooky vibes. Yeah. So then, just like they did with L.A. Night, like, L.A.'s in the talking and saying, I'm not scared, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, spooky Bray Wyatt face or spooky Uncle Howdy, you know what I'm saying, like, in the background. And he's, like, stalking us. And eventually, you know, Bray comes to us as humanized Bray with the sweater. And he's like, hey, man, I just, I just want Ramblin' Rabbit back. Like, please... Just give me my rabbit back. And like I said, just like in the movie, like it's brought us good luck. We're mm. winning matches now. We're making more money. Mm. So I'm like, I ain't giving you nothing. You ain't going to get this from me. You got to take this from me. So then now Bray starts like hunting us down, just like he did LA Night, right? And just like the leprechaun does in the movie, yeah. right? So eventually it's the whole big thing was uh, to build to a tag team match of Uncle Howdy and Bray versus Hit Row in which B-Fab gets involved, and then Alexa Bliss shows up. Mm. So then now their whole crew is together, our whole crew is together, and then we have a big blow off like that. And I literally pitched the idea when I pitched it to creative, pitched the same idea, I was like, bro, we can lose every match. Like, we're not saying like, this is our chance to look good against Bray Wyatt. Like, we don't care about that. Like, we, I would literally tell creative, I don't care if I ever win a match. Winning doesn't matter. It's the actual on-air screen time being able to put things in motion, right? So, like, they love this idea. But, like, it never happened because, mainly because it was supposed to happen. Well, Bray was going to try to push for it. Don't know if it would ever happen, but he was going to try to push for it after WrestleMania. And then, obviously, he didn't end up being a part of WrestleMania. And then we all know, unfortunately, he passed. And that was sad for everybody, myself included. And, um, you know, big shout-out. You know, I wish him nothing but the best to his family and JoJo and, and everybody but and his kids. But, like, th I would have loved to be able to. That was one thing that, like, it was cool to me that someone who I idolized as a wrestler, Bray Wyatt, yeah. that I pitched an idea to him, and he absolutely loved it. Him and his brother were, like, 100% all in. I think the fans know Bray, but not many fans get to know a Wyndham. No. Who, who no. was Wyndham to you? Well, Wyndham to me was somebody who would, like, let me sit and learn. Like, I would literally sit and just sit and watch him and L.A. Knight put matches together. Because they were, you know, they did the match, obviously. The Rumble. The Rumble. Yeah. But they were doing, like, dark matches and house shows yeah. all the, the whole time. Yeah. And I was just trying to see how. Because his character, Bray's character, Wyndham, his character was so much different than anything I ever done. So I wanted to see how he like implemented his thing into what he was doing. And then like he always had the nicest, like, I don't want to say disposition, but like he would go out of his way to make everyone around him feel comfortable. Mm. Um, and like he knew I was a huge fan of his 
because a lot of the a lot of the guys in the back knew me before I signed because I was at every WrestleMania and I was at all of the the, the functions and the behind the scenes things because I had friends in the business and I was in the NFL so I just had access via the NFL. Um, and he never made me. Brayden, Wyndham never made me feel like a fan. He made me feel like family. Mm. Um, he made me feel like I belonged in a place where, like, a lot of times I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, not because I wasn't good enough, wasn't talented enough. It's just like sometimes in the wrestling industry, people like don't treat you how you feel like you should be treated. Um, and Wyndham was never like that. Everybody loved Wyndham. He brought everybody together. He brought the locker room together. He was such a joy to be around. Um, and he was great to bounce ideas off of um, because he is a, he is by far one of the greatest wrestling minds in the history of this business. And I don't think anyone would argue that. So it's like a lot of people that are like that because they know it, they're, you know, they're always on guard. Mm. They're always like trying to protect their identity, protect themselves from, you know, people getting too close to them. But Wyndham welcomed everybody, you know? Um, we did a, we did a uh, house show in uh, Miami Christmas week during the Christmas tour. And his whole family was there. His kids were there. JoJo was there. And they were talking about the wedding that they were going to have and um, the house they, just, they had just been working on for so long and how happy they were. And, you know, um, I had my buddy Brent Grimes, who's a uh, former NFL player, four-time Pro Bowler. I had him backstage with his son and his, and his mom. And they were so not – like, he didn't know Brent at all. Like, his family didn't know Brent at all. They didn't know – him from a hole in the wall, but they treated him like they knew him forever, mm. you know? Um, he was just such a kind person, and and he would do that for not just me, he did that for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Was your goal as a kid to be in the WWE, or was your goal as a kid to play in the NFL? And crazy to think you did both. Yeah, um, so honestly, my goal as a kid was to be in WWE, um, and to be a professional athlete. I lie and say professional athlete because I really wanted to play in the NBA. Like, my dad was a basketball coach. He coached football too, but my dad has 300 career wins as a head coach in high school basketball. Mm, wow. um, so, yeah, my dad is – he's one of the best high school basketball coaches ever from the state of Maryland. But football became your sport? Football became my sport just because I stopped growing, which sounds ridiculous because I'm so big, <laughs> right? But, like – 6'5", 330 is not prototypical basketball size. Sure. Like, but, we already talked about yeah, that. Is yeah, it, but 6'5", 330 is perfect yeah. for football. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was playing basketball in high school, too, and AAU and all those things. And, like, I saw the writing on the wall. Um, but I, as a kid, at eight years old, I told my mom, I said, I'm going to play in the NBA and I'm going to play – I'm a, and then I'm going to go to WWE. Let's go through a list of all the teams that you played for. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. So where, do, where does this start? Uh, so I started. I was <laughs> – true story. Uh, I went to the Dolphins for $500 extra. Dollars. Okay, so after <laughs> – so I, you, know, you know Jimmy's favorite seafood, right? Yeah, of course. Jimmy. Yeah. Shout out John, my guy Jimmy. Uh, my guy's at Jimmy's. Um, I had my draft party at Jimmy's, which was awkward because I didn't get drafted. And uh, <laughs> so I had my draft party there. And, like, during the draft, teams are calling you saying, if we don't pick you, we want to sign you as an undrafted free agent. So teams are calling. I had, like, nine offers once the draft ended. Okay. So then the best offer that I – Wow. Maybe you put this on vibrate. I'm trying. <laughs> That's my agent. Hey, AB, I'm in the middle of a pretty important interview. Could you, like, give me a sec? Yeah, thanks for the Gucci shoes. Love you. Bye. <laughs> so, money's always calling. You yeah, see, money's calling, man. You got to answer. Money calling. So, uh, Living the gimmick. Yeah, yeah, literally. You are Suge Knight. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, I didn't get drafted, but the, the Lions offered me $7,000 signing bonus. 
<laughs> Mind you, I had about seventy dollars in my bank. But then you'd get the rookie minimum, right? If you make the team, yeah, oh, the league but, minimum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if if you, if make, you the make the team, team okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if the, you got seven G's to show up, right? So, uh, but then uh, you know the Dolphins had offered me five grand. So then my agent calls the Dolphins back, and they're like, "Yo." You know, he's going to go to Detroit. They offered him $7,000. they are like, well, we'll give him $7,500. <laughs> so I'm like, sold. So I go to Miami. I start my career in Miami. I have a great rookie season. Uh, rookie you make the team? No, so I, do, I should have made the team. I played well enough to make the team. So you make the practice squad. I, I was supposed to be on the practice squad, but I got released so that they could put me on the practice squad because you got to clear waivers, 24-hour waivers. And when I'm thinking I'm going to clear waivers to sign on the practice squad, yeah. that's when the Patriots – Claim me off waivers. Are you at that point going, oh, my God, I'm, I get to play with Tom Brady? Absolutely. That was literally <laughs> my first thought was, I play with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. This is crazy. <laughs> Mind you, Belichick, he's getting a lot of flack now. He just left the Patriots, and it seems like nobody wants to hire him. But he's the greatest coach that I've ever played for by far. Um, but uh, uh, so I'm in the Patriots for like three months. And then when they put me back down on practice squad, Miami claims me back. So then I finished my rookie year in Miami. So in my rookie year, I played for Miami and the Patriots. My second year, I'm on the Dolphins the whole time. My third year, I'm on the Dolphins till midway through the season, and the Dolphins try to put me on practice squad again, and the Seahawks claim me off waivers this time. Okay. So now I move from Miami to Seattle overnight, which, you know, those cities are exactly the same. <laughs> and, uh, and that's not an eight-hour flight. And so, uh, so that now I live in Seattle. I finished that season in Seattle. I was actually going to resign. But now you're playing for Russell Wilson. Yeah, I played with Russell, Carroll. Pete Carroll, I mean, Richard come on. Sherman, <laughs> Cam Chancellor, like some of the was best. Was that just after Just the after Super Bowl? they won the Super Bowl, yeah, like two years I after mean, they won the Super Bowl. I mean, come on. So, yeah, I played for the Patriots the year before they won the Super Bowl, and I played for the Seahawks two years after they won the Super Bowl. So I have perfect timing, <laughs> right? So uh, <laughs> Just off. So, yeah, just a bit outside. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I finished that third season with the Seahawks, and I was actually going to resign in Seattle. Um but then uh, I had to finish my master's degree at Maryland. And uh, Pete Carroll, when I met him, I was like, yo, I'm finishing my master's. I'm going to miss the workouts, but I'll be back when practice master's starts. Master's of what? I have a master's in international security and economic policy. Wow. So, yeah, I have a master's degree from the University of Maryland. I don't brag about it too much because nobody gives a shit. Right? Well, they know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, then, so I end up that offseason signing with the Buccaneers. I do the whole preseason with the Buccaneers, so now that's my fourth team. And then I should have made the Bucs. Jo uh, like um, Gerald McCoy, $100 million defensive lineman, calls me after I get released from the Bucs like, you were supposed to start next to me. I don't know what the hell they're doing. Mm. This was a gigantic mistake, but you got a chance in this league still because you put the tape out there. And he was right because I ended up getting signed by, uh, by the then Washington blank skins, right? <laughs> and we don't, we don't say that name anymore. By the way, we will talk about that too. Uh, how I got in trouble because I stood up for that. But uh, so then I'm on the I'm on DC for two years basically, on and off. And that's great because that's where you grew up. Exactly. Was that your team growing up too? No, actually, it's funny because my whole family's Cowboys fans. Uh, wow. Because yeah, that's I'm, a big rival. Yeah, huge rival. <laughs> but there's a lot of Cowboys fans in DC. People don't know that. Uh, but uh, so you know, I grew up blah 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 uh, in D.C. But so it's cool to be on my hometown team, though. Sure, yeah. Obviously, it's, my dad still has the jersey on the wall, which as a Cowboys fan, you you got to give him his props. <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> so uh, you know, and then after two years there, um, I get rele I, I get released, and um, me being me, I'm, I when I resign, I'm not resign when I sign with the Giants. I say, thank I'm going to get a chance now. The Giants, because I, when, every time I played the Giants, when I was in D.C., I would kick the Giants' ass. I had some of my best games in my career were against the Giants and the Cowboys. Um, so uh, they were obviously watched the tape. So they were like, we need this guy. So then I uh, get called from uh, them, and they're like, we want to sign you. I'm like, great. So then me, I post on Instagram laughing, saying, ah, clearly the Giants watch tape. And then, like, the last hashtag is your logo is racist, talking about the then Redskins team, which was a racist logo and a racist name. And they have since changed their name. And, and everybody in the D.C. media eviscerated me. 
the national media said I had sour grapes, uh, blah, 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 blah. That's not how you talk about a team that you just went, da, 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 da. And then two years later, they changed their name to the football team, and I have not received any apologies or anything <laughs> since that time. And I demand my apologies now. You got heat in pro wrestling. You got yeah, heat in football. You know Jeez. God forbid. And both of them for standing up for what's right. Ain't that crazy? <laughs> Ain't that crazy? All my heat is from standing up for what's right. <laughs> Maybe I should just be a shitty person like everybody else, and then the people will love me. Well, how did you know your NFL career was done? Uh, it wasn't, honestly. I just started wrestling, and I loved wrestling. I started training wrestling. Um, and you and loved wrestling since you were a kid? Since I was a little kid. Who I, was your guy when you were growing up? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest, okay? okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I can't not be honest going? here because there's a lot of things that come with what I'm about to say as a black man, but I would be lying if I didn't say that Hulk Hogan was the reason that I started watching wrestling when I was a kid. He was, 100%. Now, obviously, things have changed since then, and there's a lot of different stances on that now. Um, but Hulk Hogan was the reason I started watching wrestling. But that transitioned to Bret Hart really fast. Like, I loved Bret Hart. Yeah. And when I was on the Seahawks, I actually got to meet Bret Hart and brought him uh, to the team's, like, dinner after meetings before the game in Baltimore one time. He just happened to be in Baltimore. John from Jimmy's uh, set it up so that I could bring Bret Hart to meet the team. Man. And the whole team got to meet Bret Hart. It was so cool. Uh, you know, um, then after Bret Hart, my buddy showed me a VHS tape of Halloween Havoc 98. I didn't even know WCW existed. Like, I didn't, I had no idea. Only thing I knew was WWF. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, he showed me a VHS tape of Halloween Havoc 98 and showed me Red, uh, Eddie vs. Ray. Oh, wow. Yep. And it blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like this before in my life. So from that day forward, Ray Mysterio was the reason I watched WCW. And I told him this at his Hall of Fame speech. We were at the Hall of Fame together last year. And, uh, and I was like, yo, you're the reason I started watching WCW. Like so many people, people started watching WCW because of Flair and Sting. the Four Horsemen, Sting yeah. and... You know, the NWO mm -hmm. and all these other... Ray Mysterio is the reason I started watching WCW. I, I could see it. You know what I'm Nobody was doing what he Nobody. was doing on US TV. Nobody. So, yeah. you know, and then he had the cool outfit. It was yeah. just... So, but then after, you know, while I'm watching that, I'm watching WCW and WWF now. And then came along Stone Cold and The Rock. Yeah. And after Stone Cold and The Rock, I was hooked. Like, I was never leaving. Like, The Rock is still my favorite to this day. Mm. Um, and I've told him that since uh, when, we, when we've met. And, uh, you know, The Rock is the reason I'm still a wrestler to this day. Um, and meeting him again backstage at SmackDown a couple of months ago, um, just getting to talk to him and pick his brain, he just sat and talked to me for like 10 minutes. And uh, mind you, all these people are waiting to talk to him. Like, he, at any point, he could be like, thanks, kid, I got other things to do. But he didn't. He's, he just sat and talked to me, and we talked about everything. Yeah, he makes time for everybody. And he's the best. He, he really he's is the, the best. He's the best. And it's so, because he could just, if he wanted to, he could be an asshole and just yeah. be like, all right, whatever, and blow you off. And there's a lot of people that are less cool than The Rock that act exactly like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's not him at all. Um, so, yeah, The Rock is definitely one of my favorites. I want to ask you about Bill Belichick. Is there like Ooh. a, is there a life lesson or something that you still carry with you just as a man, as a person that you learned from Belichick? I wouldn't say as a man. As a, one thing I'll say about Bill is the fact that, like, actually, now that you mention it, yeah. Um, Bill doesn't give a damn about the outside noise. And I never – I won't say I attribute it to Bill Belichick, but I saw him as an example. Like, Bill is a really good person to, like, sit – like, if you sat down – if he wanted to talk to you, yeah. that's a whole thing. But if he wanted to talk to you, <laughs> yeah. like he'd be a great interview. He's so much fun to talk. Like you see him when he does like the the NFL honors panels with other legends. He's yeah. like completely different than he is in his like pre and post game oh, and his, pressers. Yeah, his press conference like oh, we're gonna go Because he hates because he hates how the media will take something he says and then twist it. Oh, the media doesn't do that. And, Come on. And then present it as something else. <laughs> Sounds a lot like wrestling. Oh, God, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so uh, he hates that. So because of that, he just gives you the most generic, mm. bland answers ever. So you can do that as little as possible. But in actual interactions, yeah. like I shotgun beers with Belichick and Brady <laughs> and Giselle. That's a at, great story. Yeah, at the, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the the Patriots Halloween party that Vince Wilfrick threw at a skating rink. I've heard a lot of stories that that Brady is a sneaky great drinker. Brady like, is just a great dude. Like one of the with. things, like he would win over the linemen by like drinking as much as them. Oh. 
Bro, when I saw Giselle and Tom shotgunning beers, I was like, what is happening right now? Right? And then, you know, I did, and then Bill gets involved and Vince is involved. This Vince sounds Wolfram. like a great party. It was a great party. Vince Wilford threw a hell of a Halloween party for the That's... guys. I almost made the mistake of wearing a prisoner's uh, costume, which I didn't think about at the time because I had joined the team like two months after the whole Aaron Hernandez thing. Yeah, good, uh, good call. Right? Not, not, so yeah, good call I wasn't that. thinking about yeah. Aaron Hernandez at all. My now ex-wife, then wife, was a cop for Halloween, and I was going to be a prisoner. I had the whole outfit, yeah. and we were going to wear it to the party. And she's like, what do you think about wearing that costume to the party? I was like, you're a cop. I'm a prisoner. It's like one of the most common couple yeah, you know, course, costumes yeah. ever. Yeah. She's like, yeah, but you know. In context, yeah. yeah. The whole Aaron Hernandez mm. thing, I don't think it's a, And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah. So instead, I did a terrible little Terrio outfit, and I was saying, ooh, kill him all night, and nobody got the reference. Ah, but you're but drinking was, beers with Belichick yeah, and Brady, so yeah, who cares? Yeah, yeah, And you'd be surprised how many of the world-class athletes that are in the NFL can't roller skate. It's absolutely insane to me. This was a roller skating party? Yeah, it was at a roller what, rink. What? Just adding all these layers at, to this it party. Was, it was at a roller rink. The party was at a roller rink, and uh, there was like laser tag there and like an arcade and stuff, but it was at a roller rink. Vince Wolfric rented the whole place out. Uh, it was a great time. I, I did enjoy – I've been lucky enough that like one thing that I got from my NFL career is I got to work with and learn from some of the greatest minds and biggest personalities in the history of – of football like how many people have played with russell wilson and tom brady and richard sherman you know and you for Bill belichick and gronk i played for belichick i played for Pete carroll like i played with Jameis winston like who was yeah. your quarterback when you were on the dolphins at that time uh ryan Tannehill. that's right yeah. i played with Tannehill. yeah uh you know what i'm saying i played in jerry world like yeah. how many wrestlers can say that they've been in <laughs> jerry world and it wasn't for wrestlemania don't worry i'll wait <laughs> Right, so <laughs> I, I referenced it earlier, but you've said before your character is based on Suge Knight. Yeah, it is. Was that your idea? Yeah, that's always been my idea. So when I first started wrestling <clears throat> at uh, Sausage Castle Wrestling, my first match ever was a battle royal, and I came out as this character named Suga Bear, and it's because Suge Knight, uh, when he was a kid, the reason he's called Suge is because he was his grandma, I think, called him Sugar Bear. Like that's where it came from. Wow. So. I made my character Sugar Bear, and my crew was The Row, and we all wore red, and all had bandanas tied, right? The Row, ergo, Hit Row, right? Death Row. Death Row. Death Row Records. It's all, there it is. <laughs> it's it was all in, in a row. It was in front of your face, in a row, right? So, but uh, yeah, so then I look like Suge, obviously. So I didn't look like Suge until I started shaving my head, but as soon as I started shaving my head, everywhere I go, I wear red, people are like, I'm, you, are you Suge Knight? I'm like, you know he's in prison, right? It's crazy to say, but isn't he actually bigger than you? No, I'm bigger than him. I thought, oh, I thought he was like 6'8". No, does he He might as well be with the stories that I've heard of how people were scared of him. <laughs> DJ Who Kid, my, my DJ, loved the man, doing a lot of stuff with him. He just took a DVD through a door at GCW, look at me, from Joey Janela. Like, he's a crazy man. He's, he, was, you know, he blew up as G-Unit's... DJ when 50 Cent was taking over the world and now he's one of the biggest DJs in the world. He works with Lil Wayne and I'm with, because of him, I party with Travis Scott and all these other huge artists in the world um, and Snoop Dogg and all these people. And uh, he tells a story about, uh, there was a time when 50 Cent put out a song with a, a Tupac verse on it called Realist Killers, right? And so apparently, uh, who kid got the the beat and the verse from I think it was Snoop uh, and Suge didn't want it to be put out because mm -hmm. Suge as the mm -hmm. owner of Death Row Records at the time he controlled all that so he didn't want it out so then 50 Cent didn't give a damn so 50 Cent recorded a verse put the song out and the song blew up so now Suge a bona fide gangster and killer is <laughs> furious right so now every time he finds out he's in the same city with Who Kid he's hunting him down. Right? Oh my God. So who kid tells a story, he's sitting in a, a barber shop and his haircut's halfway done. And the barber says, yo, Suge is on his way here. And with his, bar, with his hair halfway done and the mock, the, 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 the barber mock still on, he runs out of the barber shop, jumps in the car, drives to the studio, sees 50 and 50's like, yo, why you got half a haircut? Like what's, <laughs> like, what's going on? Yeah. But like, Suge had people terrified. D Jamie Foxx has stories about Suge had people terrified. So I'm not surprised people think he's that big, but Suge is actually like, 
six two three hundred. I'm 6'5", 330. So like I'm actually bigger than Shug, but Shug's persona is seven foot five hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. So the the whole thing was like you look kind of like him. Yeah. And then it all ties together with the gimmick and hair yes. and everything. Yeah, and I make music. I actually have made a lot of money outside of wrestling, like with things that had nothing to do with wrestling. So like I have business ties that you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I am tied into the streets. I have people that have made terrible decisions and still continue to. Like, I have many people that I can call on any given notice if some bad shit needs to happen. But, like, you know, I try to stay away from that. But I actually talked to Moose about the fact that, like, because he played, he played seven seasons, uh -huh. he played six, mm -hmm. six in the NFL, you have the money. Yeah. So, like, you're not as, I guess, you have you have the comfort to do what you want to do in wrestling. Yes. Rather than like you can say no is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I do say no. Like you can say no if you get if an indie booking is not going to pay your rate. Yeah. You can say no because I you, do say no. I've turned down a bunch of bookings because people think that because they're used to people pay uh, being paid x amount of dollars, like and I'm not even taking raking people over the coals. Like I'm not. <coughs> but you've got your rate, right? I you, got my rate. Yeah. And I'll even work with people. Like, I'll work for under my rate if I really want to do what you're trying to get me to do. Sure. <clears throat> but don't disrespect me in my time. Hmm. Don't pay me what I know that you could, you would pay Joe Blow, who's never been on TV in his life. Sure. Who isn't going to cut a pro One thing about me that promotions like working with me is I always give you a fire promo to sell the show. Yeah. And the fact that you can cut a great promo means, I mean, your character really doesn't have to bump that much. I don't. And that's one thing I learned from WWE. When I, and I'm so forever grateful. Me and Matt Bloom butted a lot of heads uh, while, I, while I was in the, at the PC, but we had a mutual respect for each other. And um, one of the things that he taught me was that I don't have to bump. When I first got to WWE, people don't know this, I was on the indies for a year. And I was wrestling indie style. Um, and when I got to WWE, I was still doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was like, yo, you don't have to bump. Like you can work ways around to move around or put yourself in position where you can sell into the corner, through the ropes, out of the ring, into the ropes, bouncing off, coming back, but not having to actually bump. Mm. He was like, and you'll save your body. And when you do bump, it'll matter more. And I was like, duh, duh, why, do, why did I not do that? So then like, I started working that way and I still work that way. And it's easier for me than it would be for a 185 pound luchador, obviously. Um, but at the same time, I learned that like, the fans don't wanna see big guys bump. Like, they, you can pretend, and these, especially indie show, you can pretend that you want to see it. But go watch the SmackDown uh, Fatal 4-Way tag team match that we did where I do the three-man move and I carry around Xavier Woods, Kofi Kingston, and Pete Dunne. All around the ring, I carry three grown men around the ring, walk in a circle with them, slam all three of them. Boom! The crowd erupts. Rich Holland comes in. I give him a boot to slow him down. I stuff him like I'm going to do. Give him a, a power bomb. He lifts me up, gives me an Alabama slam, and they pop even louder. Mm. What I took from that was is me slamming three people is not as impressive as one person slamming me. Mm. So why would I then let anybody do anything to me that wasn't intended to be a huge spot? You're basically saying you should be booked like a big man. Yeah. Yeah, and you want to work like a big man. And because I am one. Yeah. Because they don't exist. On the indies, who's bigger than me? Big Bill. Big Bill. But oh. he's, is he really on the indies? No. Yeah. Or not really. Yeah. But like I guess he, he does, can take any He bookings. does any yeah. bookings, but for real, he's an AW, so yeah. not really. Yeah. Like, all right, who else? I guess Moose could take indie bookings, but Moose is not, Moose is also not bigger than me. Like, Moose is my boy. I love Moose, but he's not bigger than me. Like, physically. In wrestling, he is. He's in. He's the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. But I'm saying physically, he's not bigger than me. So like, yes, but he's big. But yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah, who else? That's why you want me to come in and work like these dudes that are five ten, one eighty five. 
No thanks. What's wrong with 510 185? I mean, there's nothing wrong with it if, you know what I'm saying, you're an interviewer or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, I feel seen. You know what I'm saying? I feel attacked. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with it if you're a wrestler, too. It's just you not as big as me. I was 510 yeah. 185 in fifth grade. Yeah, and in, in, in if we, you and, <laughs> and I. That's got, a shoot. That's not even like, I'm not even. T- that's if a, you and I got into a street fight, I. I wouldn't have much of a chance. Well, you know, you, I heard that you could, you could throw him a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, you know. <laughs> I'd probably pick you up and put you down. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. What was the, you said you had a story about the ring. Oh, yeah. So this is my world champion uh, gaming ring. Can I see it? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the Los captain. Los Muertos Football Club. Yeah. I'm the captain of, uh, now we're called Whole Lotta FC, but I'm the captain of a team uh, that has Damn, look at this thing. former NFL players, rappers, politicians. There it is. Uh, right. Anything you could think of, every walk of life, down to like just fans of mine that I've known for years. We play uh, EA Sports FC, and uh, we do this mode called Pro Clubs. And in Pro Clubs, instead of 1v1, like I have a team, you have a team, yep. it's 11 on 11. Oh. We're playing a position on the field. It's like a real soccer game. Oh, wow. So – and we've been ranked as high as 28th in the world out of 200,000 teams. So the year that we the, – the way that they do the, – they used to do the championship system is you start in Division 10 and then you got to work your way up to Division 1. And then you can, win ti- you can win titles all along the way. And the first year that we won our first D1 titles, we got these rings. And there's like 30 guys on the team. And, uh, no wonder everyone on the plane thinks you play football or basketball. You know what I'm saying? There's 30 guys on the team. Like, and, no, it's from playing fake soccer. And, uh, and 11 and video of the, game soccer. 11 of the guys uh, played in the NFL. Like it's the oh, team. Wow. So we got some NFL caliber World <laughs> Championship rings. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got your hand in everything, and I just think it's so fascinating. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what the rest of 2024 has in store for you. I end every interview talking about gratitude because it's mm-hmm. a big part of my life. What are three things in your life, AJ, that you're grateful for right now? Um, I am grateful to be alive. Um, sadly, I heard this saying, uh, you don't appreciate your own mortality until one of your parents dies. And for me, that was the truth. Mm. I didn't realize how grateful I was to be alive until my mom passed away uh, six years ago. Um, my mom passed away overnight. Um, she overdosed on codeine. And um, I take, like, drugs and, like, the drug life and things like that very seriously yeah. because it has personally affected my life. Um, I've, she- I've heard, like, people say, like, you know, if you see your – my parents live in Canada, right? Mm-hmm. I live here in L.A. So if I see my parents three times a year – Mm-hmm. and my parents are 70, they live to be 90, I'm only going to see them 60 more times. Yeah. And that one hit so hard when I yeah. thought about that. Yeah. It's sad. It's sad because, like, like I said, like, the thing about my mom is that, like, I could tell something was going on with my mom, but I had no idea what it was. Like, I could tell something was off, yeah. but I didn't know what it was. She lived in Arkansas. She moved back to Arkansas with her family. Um, after her and my dad got divorced, she moved back to Arkansas to live with her family where they lived. And, um, uh, you know, I didn't see her as much. And when I did see her, I could tell something was off, but like, I had no idea what it was. And then one day she just, I've got a call from my sister live on, I'm on Good Morning Football on the NFL Network, one of the biggest morning TV shows, like literally at the time, other than Good Morning America, the second biggest morning TV show in the country. And during a commercial break, while I'm in the bathroom, I get a phone call from my sister saying that my mom had passed away. And, like, I have to go back out on air yeah. and finish the show. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? So, like, that kind of overnight shock really, that really messed me and my sister up for a long time. Um, and, but it, it gave me a greater appreciation for what people are going through in their lives. Um, and it made me more grateful for my number two thing I'll say is that I get to give back to my community. Um, like, you know, I do my canned food drive for Sarah's house. Um, and Sarah's house is a homeless shelter in Fort Meade, Maryland. And they, um, they provide housing and food and all any type of life essentials for, 
um, a lot of children and families, like moms, getting away from a domestic violence issue, um, you know, um, and I do events with them all the time. I do my canned food drive with them. It's the biggest event of the year. Um, I'm grateful that I'm able to support my people in my community that need it most. Yeah. Um, and then thirdly, I'm grateful that I get to do what I want to do and live my life the way that I want to live it. Um, I get to play video games all week and then on the weekend go be a fake supervillain. Um, so it's like, it's it's incredible to me that this is my life. That yeah. I, I get to do whatever I want all week and then on every Friday, Saturday, I show up somewhere and I'm the worst person alive. Right? <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's, it's great that I get to live my life like this. But yeah, I'm grateful for my life. I'm grateful for being able to support my family and my people in my community. And I'm grateful um, for the fact that I get to do what I want when I want to do it. Three great things. Yeah. AJ, such a pleasure to finally do this yeah. in person. Thank you for making this happen. No, thank you. And thank you for F3 Energy. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, bro. That was great, man. Appreciate thank you, man. You.